I thank God for this wonderful opportunity I have to bring the Word of God at this year's conference, uh, which is tagged Amsterdam National Virtual Congress 2020. I really thank God for the Board of Trustees of our great association. I thank God for the Council of Elders. I equally bless the name of the Lord for the Board of National Executives, more so for God helping them to brave the hearts to put something like this together. Of course, this is the first time we are having a Congress online. So I believe this Board of National Executives deserves a round of applause for putting up something like this and for the extent to which God has helped them. And we give God the praise for this. We equally thank God for the National Executive Council and of course for every member of Amsterdam. And I equally thank God for non-members who are in the house to be part of us since this program is only in online this year. The Lord bless you all. Shall we pray? Almighty Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have to study at your feet again. I thank you for the privilege I have to bring your word to this house. Lord, I pray you give me utterance to declare your mind alone. Daddy, you are the one we want to see. You are the one we want to hear. Please reveal yourself to us. The mysteries will need to be unraveled to help us in our work with you and in our work for you. Please let us receive in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Almighty Father. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen. God bless you one more time. You are welcome. I'm speaking on the theme for this year's Congress. And the theme is pressing towards the mark. Pressing towards the mark. Of course, this is taken from the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verse 13 to verse 14. Permit me to read from here. The Bible says therein, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul the Apostle is the one speaking here. He said, he did not count himself to have apprehended, but one thing he did, he chose to forget the things that were behind him and to reach forth unto the things which were before. And in verse 14 he said that he pressed toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We'll be looking at some key facts from these two Bible verses. And these are the key facts I want us to see as we begin. You must identify one thing you need to do. And then you must learn to forget the past and reach out to what lies ahead. You must equally press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of Christ. Another key fact is this. However, the pressing is not as important <laughs> as the mark. Your pressing will be in vain if you don't know the mark you are pressing towards. It is like a game of football without a goalpost. Because if there is a game of football without a goalpost, all the dribbles that are very skillful, all the shots that are very ferocious, all the beauty of the game will be in vain without a goalpost. Of course, it is equally like a running in a race without a finish line. Without it, the race will be unending because you need the tape at the end. You need the finish line to let you know that you have attained the mark. Without that, in a race, then the race will be unending. Apostle Paul knew the importance of the mark. He knew the importance of the goal and the finish line in ministry. That was why he boldly declared, and I love this, in 2 Timothy. This beloved man of God said in chapter 4 verse What did he say? He said, I fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Why was he able to say this? It was because he understood the importance of knowing the mark. When he attained the mark, he was able to say that I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. 
Beloved, the mark in this context means a point of focus, a point of reference. And what is a focus? A focus means a central point of attraction, a central point of concentration, a central point of attention, a central point of activity. That's a noun of what a focus is. And when we look at it as a verb, it means giving all attention, giving all time, giving all energy to a particular activity. That is what a mark is. Our Lord Jesus Christ emphasized the place of focus in John chapter 4, verse 34. Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish the work. My meat, my food, my purpose, my mark, my focus, the essence of my living is to do the will of him that sent me out to finish his work. This is indicative of the place of focus. As a matter of fact, our Lord Jesus Christ admonished us in Matthew 6.33. This is a verse we know very well there and he said, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. The kingdom of God in this context is the mark. It is the focus. Remember, I said earlier, and permit me to repeat at this point, that pressing without knowing the mark will be a labor in futility to be a work in vain. If you don't know the mark towards which you are pressing, then you'll be laboring in vain. I'll be praying at this point, this will not be our portion in the name of Jesus Christ. There are some wise men that said some things and I've documented some of them. A man known as Henry David Thoreau said, it is not enough to be busy. So are the ants. He said, the question is, what are we busy about? It is not enough to be busy. The question is, what are we busy about? There is a question people often ask, what are you doing? This is a question which only you can answer. What are you doing? It's a question finding out what are you busy about? But there's another way you look at it, what you are doing. This is affirmative, it's an affirmation of what can be seen to be done. So it's not enough to tarry at the point of what are you doing, meaning we want to find out what's your life all about. One must graduate to the level of what you are doing, what the world can see that you are doing. That's the mark, that's the focus that the world knows you are pursuing. That's what everyone can return with. So Thoreau said, it's not enough to be busy, so are the ants. The question is, what are you busy about? Another man, Tony Robbins says, one reason only few people achieve what they truly want is that most people never direct their focus. They never concentrate their power. Most double their way through life, never deciding to master anything in particular. The words of Robbins there. Most double their way through life, never deciding to master anything in particular. And another man put it so bluntly and succinctly. Senisa, maybe Senica, S-E-N-E-C-A, the name of the man. He said to be Everywhere is to be nowhere. Wow, wow. To be everywhere is to be nowhere. Another way of saying this is jack of all trades, master of none. We are talking about the mark. Before we go into the pressing, I press toward the mark. What is the mark in this context? Talking about John the Baptist, we know him very well. In Mark chapter 1 verse 3, the Bible says, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. The voice, take note, not the noise, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, saying, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. There is a fact from the scripture. John's voice was not a mere noise because the message in his mouth had a specific focus. His message made a mark because it was focused Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. That was the mark. That was the purpose he pursued throughout his life. That was the essence of his coming, to announce the coming of the Lord, the coming of the Messiah. He said, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So his voice did not dissipate for nothing. His voice did not end up being a mere noise because the message in his mouth had a specific focus. I have discovered that voice 
minus focus equals noise. Unfortunately, not knowing the mark is the bane of many Christians and evil servants of God today. There is so much noise without voice, so much efforts without effects, so much activity without action, so much motion without movement, so much announcement without pronouncement. Why? Because there is so much distraction, not knowing the mark. When you don't know the mark, your noise, I mean, your voice will end up being just a mere noise. And all the motion will be without movement. All the announcement you make will not be backed up to become a pronouncement from heaven. I pray this will not be a portion in the name of Jesus. We must know the mark which we want to press towards so that we can obtain the prize of the eye calling. The early apostles almost fell into this error. You can check this in Acts 6, 1 to 7. In verse 1, we are made to know that there were some complaints from the Grecians among the Hebrews. The Grecians were equally known as the Hellenists. Who do we call the Hellenists? These were the Jews that were not born in Palestine as at that time. They were born outside Palestine. As a matter of fact, the language they understood was the Greek language. So they were not the original Jews. So they did not speak Hebrew as a first language. Greek was their first language, even though they were Jews by nature, by birth. So these were the Hellenists. So these were, were part of the early church. So we knew them as Grecians. We knew the other ones as the Hebrews. So they had a problem as for the welfare of the widows in the early church. And there was a grumbling. The grumbling got to the hearing of the apostles, the twelve, the elders of the churches at that time. So they were complaining there was partiality, that things were not well distributed. It's amazing that dissension had come into the church so early in the life of the church. A crisis was rearing its ugly head so early in the life of the church. So I'm not surprised when we see some things happening in the church today. We had them in the early church, but the apostles were wise enough to know what to do. They gave a response in verse 2. They said, your complaint is true. Your murmuring is correct. Your grumbling is not unfounded. However, verse 2, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Meaning they knew the focus of what God had sent them to do. It was the word of God to learn it, I mean to teach it and to help other people to understand it. So they said it is no reason. What you have said is not baseless. But still, it is no reason for us to leave the word of God and serve tables. And they took a step in verse 3. They said, Brethren, look ye among you seven men of honest report. One, full of the Holy Ghost. Two, and full of wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. We cannot go into verse 3. It's a message for another day. Men, full of the Holy Ghost, of honest report, and full of wisdom. That was the instruction they gave to the body of Christ, the disciples that were complaining. And they had a resolution. They voiced it out in verse 4. We will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Beloved, pressing is not enough. You must know the mark towards which you must press. They said, we'll give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. And something was done in verse 5. The thing pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, they chose Philip, they chose Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, and Parmenius, and Nicholas. Hallelujah. That was a choice they made. And here we have the result. What happened? The word of God increased and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Hallelujah. Beloved, they got this result because they refused to serve tables but focused on the mark. Serving tables in our own context means inordinate cares for money. Inordinate cares for popularity. We're talking about competition, rivalry. When these things have a place in your, in your life, then you can be sure you are likely to miss the mark. So if you truly want to pursue the mark, you really want to press towards the mark, then you must make up your mind that I'm not in the ministry to serve tables. No, no. I am to be dedicated continually to the ministry of the word. That's the purpose for which God has called me into the ministry. And I want to tell us some benefits of focus at this point. Number one benefit of focus, energy is saved. Two, stress is reduced. Output is increased. 
identity is established, promotion is fast tracked. When you are focused, proficiency is developed, resources are well invested, obstacles become insignificant. When you are focused and you know the mark you are pursuing, distractors and even detractors are silenced. Hallelujah. So the question at this point you'll be asking Brother Mike is this. What is the mark we are talking about? And this is the mark. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 makes it very clear. There the Bible says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus Christ is the mark to, towards which we are to press. Any other pursuit is a no-no. This is the ultimate pursuit of every child of God. This is the ultimate pursuit of every servant of God. Jesus Christ, looking unto Jesus, that I may know him, as Apostle Paul cried out. The him here, you know, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering be made conformable unto his that I may know him, the Lord Jesus. He is the mark we are talking about here. So how do you make Jesus your mark? How do you pursue him? How do you press towards him? You do this by seeking to know him the more, seeking to honor him the more, seeking to praise him, to please him, to serve him, to preach him and make him the center, the center of your message, making him the full groom of your message, making him the, the focus towards which you are pressing. Jesus is the mark. We are talking about here not money not popularity <laughs> beloved not fame jesus is the one we are pursuing he is the mark but blessed be god the bible says seek ye first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these other things should be added unto you this to tell you that seeking jesus as the center of our focus <laughs> does not mean we'll be precluded or excluded from all of these other things. Hallelujah. We equally have them because we need them. But they should not form the basis of your life as a minister of God. I often tell people, if you are in the ministry to make ends meet, you will soon meet with your hand. If you are in ministry <laughs> because you have nothing to do, then you may remain without anything to do. You are not in ministry because you are redundant. You are in ministry because you have a call. If you are in ministry because of honoraria, you'll end up meeting with this honor. That's just the truth of the matter. So, beloved, Jesus is the one we are running after, is the one we are pursuing, is the mark. So we are laying a foundation here. I press towards the mark for the price of the eye calling. I press towards the mark. So we are looking at the mark here now. At this point now, we are going to combine two things together, the pressing and the mark, and then obtaining that price of the eye calling. We'll be using a man of God. I know, we know very well as a case study here. But permit me to tell you something that has always been my prayer. And I believe we all need it. And this is a prayer I often pray silently. And this is the first time I'll be making this prayer public. My Lord Jesus, in my sphere of influence, please let people know you far more than they know me. This is another way of re-echoing uh, John the Baptist's, uh, Baptist's prayer, he said, He must increase while I decrease. Father, Lord Jesus, in my sphere of influence, wherever I am physically, wherever I am present online, wherever I am, Father, I pray, let people know you far more than they know me. And let's look at something from the life of Elijah and Elisha. We know that Elisha was one of the sons of the prophets. We can't go out into how Elijah brought him into ministry by throwing his mantle on him. We don't want to go into that because of time. But there's an account in 2 Kings chapter 2 from verse 1 to verse 5 or verse 15. We know this very well. It was getting to the time for our friend, that wonderful prophet Elijah, to leave planet Earth. It was time for him to go. It was getting to the end of his ministry. This wonderful prophet had Elisha so close to him. And the truth of the matter is, as he knew he was going, I believe Elisha equally got an inkling that his master was leaving. Because their journey began from Gilgal. The two of them were there at Gilgal. 
and Gilgal is known as a rolling place. This was where God rolled away the reproach of Egypt from the neck of the children of Israel. So God deliver, delivered them from Egyptian slavery. This was where the Israelites encamped after crossing the Jordan. This was where they kept the first Passover in the land of Canaan. This was where the children of Israel set up the 12 memorial stones that were taken from the Jordan. This was where the children of Israel were circumcised. This was a wonderful place, a memorable place, a foundational place, an amazing place, a place where we want to dwell and enjoy God so much. Gilgal, what an awesome place it was. Hallelujah. But Elijah said to Elisha, what did he say? He told him, tarry ye here while I go over to Bethel. But Elisha refused. He said, my master, as you live and as your soul lives, we are going together. He refused to tarry there in uh, Gilgal, as good as Gilgal was. So he chose to press on after his master. And he crossed over to Bethel. And at Bethel, there was a school of prophets there. And I believe this was what essentially Elijah went about doing. He went about to visit all the schools of the prophets where he had ministered, where he had been of influence to them, to announce to them that something was about to happen, or oh, whatever it was. These other sons of the prophets did not get uh, the full uh, import of what was about to happen, or they got it, but they were not really interested. Because the sons of the prophets in Bethel said to Elisha, they said, Noah's thou, do you know that your master will be taken from your head very, very soon? Meaning they knew what was about to happen, but they had no interest in it. This is the hallmark of people who do not press, those who are not willing to press. They know things are happening, but it's like they are just not interested in it. Elisha said to them, yes, I know. Hold ye your peace. In other words, I know. You wait and see. The result will justify the means very, very soon. You can tarry here and remain here and become commentators of ministers of God. Become a major critic and an armchair critic of other people's ministry. Remain here. Hey, continue to analyze while I go there to synthesize my life and ministry. Remain here and be watching. Hold your peace. Something will happen very, very soon. I guess he told them. He refused to tarry at Bethel. And Bethel, as you know, by implication, is known as the altar of God. The place of the altar. The house of God. Elisha did not terminate his journey at Bethel because he wanted something more than the house of God. You know what he wanted? He wanted the God of the house. Hallelujah. If you truly want to press on, you will never be satisfied with just the house of God. Your desire, your pursuit, your hunger, your thirst will be the God of the house. That I may know him. God, you are the one I want to know. Oh, not my G.O., you are the one I want to know. Oh, not my pastor, you are the one I want to know because you are the author and the finisher of my faith. You are the one I want to know. So he preferred the God of the house, oh, to the house of God. You know the story of the sick man by the pool of Bethesda in John chapter 5, verse 2 to verse 9. This man was wasting away. What was he waiting for? He was waiting for the moving of the water. You know, he complained to Jesus when he asked him, do you want to be made whole? He said, yes, master, but I have no man. What an insult. You know why? How can someone like Jesus stand before you and you could still utter those words, I have no man. The whole son of God himself standing before you. You should know that the man that sums up all men is standing there. Oh, the man that is beyond all men is standing there. That's ultimately what you need. But he said, I have no man. You know what? He was waiting for the moving of the water. Whereas what he actually needed was Jesus, the mover of the water. This was what Elisha understood. I will not tarry at Bethel. I will press on towards the mark. We are going to Jericho together. I will not stay at Bethel. We thank God Jesus showed up for that sick man by the pool of Bethesda. Otherwise, going by the law of probability, the man would have died waiting because he, he, was, he, he was sick. This man could not move. He was crippled. He was impotent. He was there. He could not do anything by himself. He needed men to carry him. This is a lesson for some of us. 
You are yet waiting for a benefactor to come and lift you up. Your prayer is, Lord, send me helpers of ministry. Wonderful prayer. Good prayer. But I want to urge you, make this the topmost of your prayers. Lord, you are the author and the finisher of my faith. You are the one I need ultimately. A man you don't send to me cannot help me. And I often advise people, when you sit somewhere, you are moaning and groaning, you are annoyed. Oh, that I have this brother in America, I have this sister in US, I mean in, in UK, I have this person in Australia. Oh, we are so close. At a point in time, I helped him. Now he has forgotten me. Beloved, quit anger, quit bitterness, cry unto God. Any man that you think can help you but refuses to help you, then the fact of the matter is God has not sent him to help you. Your true benefactors will not disappoint. There are men who make promises and they terminate at the point of promises because they are men, but God can never fail you. Hey, just like Jesus eventually helped, by, helped that man by the pool of Bethesda, the man went home healed because the mover of the water had come. Oh, despising the moving of the water. Hallelujah. I pray for you and for myself this day that the mover of the water will move waters on our behalf. Our lives will not remain the same. Our ministries will not remain the same. Our ministries will not lack divine and human help in the name of Jesus Christ. The journey continued to Jericho. And Jericho is known as a place of fragrance, the place of sweet odor. And this is where we have another school of the prophets. Where I believe Elijah equally went to inform them of what was about to happen. But 50 sons of the prophets equally said to our beloved friend there. What did they say to him? They said to him that your master is about to be taken from your head. But the man said to them as usual, don't worry. I know you hold your peace. They tried to dissuade him. But the man did not allow himself to be dissuaded. He told them to hold their peace. Remember, Jericho is a place of charisma, fragrance, sweet odor. That's the razzmatazz of life and ministry. Hey, your ministry cannot live on the level of charisma. Charisma may get you up there. It is only character that keeps you there. This is why a lot of men of influence... Hey, that are charismatic in nature, have not been able to sustain oh, what God is doing through them because they lack character. It is character that keeps you there. Elisha did not terminate his journey at Jericho. Even as his master told him he was going to Jordan, he said, as your soul lives, hey, as you live, my father, we are going together. He chose to press on. He pressed towards the man. And Jordan, uh, this is the source, this is the watering place. This is where 50 sons of the prophets stood afar and they chose to watch what was about to happen to Elisha. There at Jordan, in Yoruba, they will say, They wanted to see how we'd be messed up. Hey, the father you were so keen about, the father you keep talking about, oh my father, oh my master, hey, now he's about to leave you, we'll see what will become of your life. Like people will tell you, now you are saying you are serving God. You are telling us you are a servant of God. We will see what will become of your life. It is prophetic. They said we will see. And indeed, they will see. They will see the goodness of God in our lives. They wanted to see what will become of Elisha. This is the team of, uh, of, 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 of watchers. I call them watchers. Hallelujah. Let them tarry there. But I belong to the team of workers. Hey, workers for God. Hallelujah. Hey, I leave the terrain of backbiters because backbiters always remain in the back. Hey, I'm a frontliner for God. Don't stay with the watchers. Don't be part of those who, st who stand afar to watch, doing nothing, just to analyze and see what is happening. Elijah chose to move ahead. Elisha chose to go with him. And as the journey continued, beloved, they got to the Jordan. And at the Jordan, Something had to happen. They had to cross to the other side, but the Jordan was full. What did Elijah do? According to the word of God, the Bible says, he took his mantle, he wrapped it, and struck the river Jordan. The river parted either way. And the man of God crossed on dry ground. I thank God for Elisha. Elisha was a courageous man. This man had not crossed the Jordan in his life. That was the first time. But seeing his master, 
crossed the Jordan was enough for him. He ran after him. The Bible says, and the two of them went over. They went across on dry ground. He was not drowned. He went on dry ground. He was not drowned. That was how they crossed to the other side. And on the other side, according to 2 Kings, which we are reading chapter 2, verse 9 says something that is quite profound. And Elijah said unto Elisha, let's pause at this point. Elijah said unto Elisha, take note, all along, the only words Elijah uttered were, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me. From Gilgal, the Lord has sent me to Bethel. From Bethel, the Lord has sent me to Jericho. From Jericho, the Lord has sent me to Jordan. Tarry here. Those were the words he spoke. No other words were uttered. And Elisha's constant response to this utterance for his master were, As the Lord lives, and as your soul lives, I will not leave thee. This is the hallmark of good pressers. I will not leave thee. Hey, Father, things may not be okay. Things may not be augering well for me in ministry. Things may not be going according to plans. Things may not be going the way I thought they will. Things may not be rosy. Father, I will not leave you. Hey, men may be mocking me, telling me I'm wasting my time. I know you have called me. Oh, my decision is this. I will not leave you. This is how to press on towards the mark. I will not leave you. Elisha continued. He refused to tarry. He continued to press on. And after seeing that Elisha had passed the test of pressing, Elisha said, Elijah said, Ask what I shall do for thee. Hallelujah. This is the result of pressing continually. You get the hearing of God. Oh, you get the attention of God. You may be passing through some tests now on account of things that appear not to be going well for you. Beloved, things may appear not to be going on well, but in heaven the record is things are going on well because even when Joseph was in the well, it was still well for him because he was moving according to a divine timetable. So he said, ask what I will do for you. And then what did Elisha say? He said, Master, I want a double portion of your market spirit. He did not say of your anointing. Because the anointing is only a subset of the full set. And the full set is the spirit. Everything that makes Elijah, Elijah. Multiplied by two. Hallelujah. Give to me. That's what I want, master. Very simple. But when the master will respond, he said, you have asked a hard thing. <laughs> what kind of son is this? A double of what I am. A double of everything that makes me, me. That's all you want. It's a hard thing. He said, nevertheless, there is a nevertheless dimension for every good presser. Hey, even when others are failing, there is a nevertheless for a good presser. You will not fail. Hey, when others are saying there is a casting down, there is a nevertheless dimension. You say there is a lifting up. Hey, when people are saying there is sickness all over, there is a nevertheless for a child of God. I shall not be sick. Because I carry a different DNA. Nevertheless, this is what the other sons of the prophets missed. Because they chose to watch from afar. The one that pressed received the nevertheless. What is it? He said, if you see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be unto thee. It shall be unto thee. But if not, it shall not be. So, full stop. The Bible says in verse 3, And it came to pass. <laughs> As they still went on and talked, meaning the journey did not end at the point of the promise. So, beloved, receiving a promise from God is not the end of a journey. You still have to go ahead. As they still went on and talked, and I wonder what Elijah was talking to Elisha. I guess in the course of the journey, he was telling him, look at that place. That was where we held the first crusade so many years ago. Oh, look there. An amazing encounter happened there when we came here for some ministry work some years back. And I'm very sure, I believe, that as he was pointing, Elisha refused to turn his head because he had said, nevertheless, if you see me. So these other things you are pointing to are not the things I need to see. You are the one I need to see. The Yoruba man will say, 
You are the one I need to fix my eyes on. Fix your eyes on God. Don't look at that man of God who just bought a new SUV, 2020 model. You don't need that. Don't look at the man of God who is building his third or fourth or fifth house. Hey, fix your eyes on God. Don't look at that man of God who is getting popular all around the world. You don't need that. Fix your eyes on God. This man fixed his eyes on him because he said, Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from thee, and the Bible says, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. It was sudden. It was in an instance. And in verse 12, the Bible says, and Elijah saw it. I love that. Elijah saw it. You will see the goodness of God. Hey, as we move on, in ministry, I pray for every one of us, Amsterdam members, non-Amsterdam members who are part of this year's virtual congress. We will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. And Elisha saw it and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. You know why he said, my father, my father? In case Elijah did not hear it the first time, he said it twice. My father, my father, even that my father is raised to power too. And he went on to describe everything he saw, to let his master know that he saw everything. The chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And the Bible says he saw him no more. You know why? He no longer needed him. He no longer needed him. What he needed had come. The Bible says he took hold of his own clothes and ran them in two pieces. We can't go into the details of this, but to truly press towards the mark, you must tear off and put off some clothes. The cloth of envy, the cloth of rivalry, the cloth of bitterness, the cloth of, uh, of unforgiveness, of anger, of inordinate ambition. You have to tear them off because what you need has come. Verse 14 says, and he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him. Take note, he did not pull the mantle. The mantle fell. Why? Because he had worked for it. He pressed for it. The mantle on his own accord fell from for it and he picked it. And as I begin to round off, Elisha turned around to return into work, into the work God had ordained him for, to go back into the world to manifest for God, holding the mantle, what he wanted. But by this time, River Jordan had filled up again to the banks. This was a problem that came the way of Elisha in the early hours of his ministry. A full river Jordan, he had a problem to solve. This is the situation at times, after a congress like this, when you expect everything to become rosy, no problem, no azules, what happens? You discover it's a problem that comes to confront you. It's because you are carrying a mantle. Hey, a mantle to, to part the Jordan. The Jordan will get filled because you carry the mantle to part it. Hey, the problem of finance, lack of finance will come because you have a mantle to surmount it. The problem of, of, of uh, closed doors will come because you have a mantle that opens doors. As a matter of fact, the, the problem of persecution and hatred will surface because you have a mantle that can overcome them. The Jordan filled up again. A problem came because he had the mantle. And then what happened? The Bible says, and he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters. And I don't know what happened at that point. It sounds to me from this scripture like the water refused to part. He smote the water. And then the Bible says, and said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? Thinking it was a mantle that will do it alone. Maybe for a moment he forgot that there is a power behind the man to the Lord God. So God allowed him to have a good lesson from the beginning. It sounded like the water did not part immediately. And they took the mantle of light that fell from him and smote the water. Mm -hmm. Come on. And said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, having asked, where is the Lord God of my father? The Bible says they parted either and thither. And Elisha went over. Hallelujah. So, beloved, as you press on, don't forget the Lord God, our Father. Hey, don't depend on past experience. You have been doing this for years. 
We know how to do it. God knows how to humble a man in a, in a moment. <laughs> he knows how to bring you down from your high horse. When you think you can preach without even reading, without studying the word of God again, all I need to do is to open my mouth and they will feel it. Beloved, the mouth God fills in the mouth that had eaten the scripture before. You will not feel an empty mouth. So where is the Lord God of my father and the water parted? The lesson here is this. Elijah's final miracle of parting the Jordan was the start of miracles for Elisha. The peak, the final, possibly the most memorable, was only the beginning for Elisha because he decided to press. He pressed on. And finally in verse 15, and when the sons of the prophets who were to view at Jericho, the watchers, when they saw him, the Bible says, they said, the spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. They put a stamp on it. They agreed. Every of our mockers saying we don't know what he's doing, though, they will know. Because this one said, they said the spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. The world we know that we are serving a living God. We are not wasting our time in ministry. Hallelujah. As we expand on every horizon, physically, virtually, online, offline, Hey, as drama ministers, of ministers of the gospel, the world we know that we are serving a true God, a living God. So shall it be in the name of Jesus. And finally, and they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. They bowed. They surrendered. That indeed, you have got it. We will get it. As we press on, we will not miss it. And I want to tell you as I close now, that the ultimate result the ultimate benefit, the ultimate reward of all our present is to make it to heaven in the end. Because whatever you make on earth without making it to heaven, hey, hey, it's a great loss. It's a great waste. It's my prayer for you and for myself that we will not show people the way to heaven and end up in hell. And the other side of this prayer which I pray for every one of us, is that as we carry a lot of people along with us, we will make it to heaven in the end and we'll receive the prize of the eye calling of God in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you for your time. Let's have a word of prayer before we go. Almighty Father, we thank you for releasing your word. Thank you for giving inspiration and for giving utterance. Take the praise in the name of Jesus. I pray these words will find a place in our hearts. They will not fall to the ground, Lord, without yielding fruits as you intended them. These words will grow and they will bear fruits. Our lives and ministries will not remain the same after this. Thank you, faithful Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray it. Amen. Thank you, beloved brethren. The Lord bless you. Amen.